Okay, guys, welcome to session two of I Choose. And so today what we're going to be talking about is what to do when your choices all are bad or also, you know, sometimes, sometimes like the hand we're dealt sucks, right? There's just so many things that happen to us that have nothing to do with our choices. You know, it just got thrown in our lap and, and that does really suck, right? It could be uh, all kinds of things. It's, it's how other people treat us. A lot of times it's other people, right? And like so many things are out of our control. But sometimes it's health issues. Sometimes it's natural disaster things. There's all kinds of things that sometimes give us a hand that is not the greatest. And so today, um, uh, I want to talk about the fact that we can't choose the hand that we're dealt, but we get to choose how we respond to it. Yeah. And that makes all the difference, honestly, you know? Um, and so I'm going to be taking you to a record today about four guys that I just find this record so inspiring in so many ways because these guys have it as bad as it could be. This was during a time... Um, it's, it's a story about four men that were lepers. Now, lepers was a skin disease that was really horrible. Like you had chunks of flesh falling off and people were ostracized from everybody else. So being born with, you know, something like, um, any health issues, but this was just a really bad that, would you say that that's being dealt a bad hand, right? Uh, and it's unfair, right? It's just totally not deserved. There's nothing to do with them at all. But on top of that, they were four guys that were in a city where there, or in a whole area that had a f horrible famine. The famine was so bad that right in the previous chapter to where we're going to be picking up, um, women ate their children. And I know it's just pretty, I mean, I can't even imagine being you know, in that desperate, uh, why people that's bad. Right. And then on top of that, people were paying like fortunes for a donkey's head, which is supposed to be like the most disgusting thing to eat ever where people were so hungry that they would, were paying a fortune, you know, that's how scarce food was. So, um, uh, let's pick this up in this story. Um, in second Kings, uh, chapter seven in the old Testament, um, oh my gosh, uh, Kings, Chronicles, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, first and second Samuel, first and second Kings, uh, second Kings chapter seven. So in the old Testament, um, and so this had all come about because the, at the time this was Samaria that we're talking about and the Syrians, uh, had besieged Samaria and, um, and they, at that time, they were thought of as being a very, uh, like brutal nation in, um, in the countries that they, uh, captured and besieged. So in, uh, second Kings, uh, chapter seven and verse three, it says, now there were four leprous men at the entrance of the gate. And they said to one another, why are we sitting here until we die? If we say we will enter the city and the famine is in the city and we shall die there. And if we sit here, we die also. Now, therefore, come, let us surrender to the army of the Syrians. If they keep us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall only die. Okay, so this is just... Okay, this is bad, right? So you can see this. And this is just... To me, there's just such... um. There's so many parallels to things that we face. For the most part, we're not facing things quite this bad generally, right? But they're sitting outside the gate of their city where there's a famine. People are starving. It's horrible. And they're sitting outside the gate. And the Syrians, which were considered this just super brutal nation, so it was pretty assured if they went to the Syrians, they, they, they would likely die. Um, it would be kind of like at that time in terms of the reputations um, that, that the Syrians had, it would be like surrendering to the Taliban, right? It's just like not, you would not expect good things to happen if, you know, you said, okay, we're coming over 
to surrender ourselves. So you've got three situations. They're outside of the gate where they're at. So if they sit there, they say that they'll die. If they don't do anything, they'll die. If they go back to where they came from, the city that they're from, they will die. And then if they go forward to the Syrians, they will probably die, you know? <laughs> and if they don't die, they're going to be enslaved. So, you know, are any of those good options? No. You know, how many times have you guys been in situations where some of the issue is you're looking and going, I don't like any of my options right there. They all sound painful. They all sound, uh, yeah, just horrific in a way. And so a lot of times too, it's just like, we tend, and I love like in the when I first um, uh, learned God's word, I, I uh, a lot of my verses that I memorized were King James, the Old English, right? And so in the Old English, it says, "Sit we here until we die," and that that saying like resonates whenever I think about being stuck someplace, right? That is not good, and where I feel immobilized, right? Where I feel frozen, like there's nothing I can do. It's I think of that. I think of it in the King James of sit we here until we die. If you stay and don't move, you die. It's a slow death, you know? It's kind of like, um, you know, a, a crab in, you know, in a pot of, of water, right? Where it's a slow death to sit there, but still death kind of a thing. So um, anyway, uh, so I love the fact that they, that, what I th and I think that this is a really good principle because we're not always part of what I want to look at what sometimes keeps us from moving at all. Like there's certain things that, that we have in our head that keep us kind of stuck in whatever lousy circumstance that we're in and from not moving. And so I wrote down just a few of kind of the, I don't know, the lies, I guess, um, that keep us passive. And I want you in this just think about if there are places right now that are kind of feeling stuck for you, you know, where things aren't moving. So the first, uh, I just wrote down four kind of major lies or myths that keep us um, from taking the risk of doing something different than where we're at right now. Um, one is the teaching, um, and that's really big these days, is God is in control. You know, a lot of people say that, like I've even seen it bumper stickers, right? That say, relax, God is in control. Kind of like, <sighs> it's the idea that whatever happens, somehow it's the will of God. And it is not biblical. It isn't in God's word. If, if I really encourage you guys, there's so many misunderstandings in, in the Bible because of the fact that people pull things out of context from what the word of God says and, and uh, the Bible actually clearly says that right now Satan is in control of the world. And so if you see that, then it makes a little bit more sense because why we're seeing some of the things that we see and that there's beautiful things that God made, but if God was running it, we wouldn't have the heinous hurts that we would have. And somehow so often people are trying to justify it that in everything, like, and you also hear everything happens for a reason. And usually that has to do with still God, often like that there's some purpose. And it, it, somehow people, I mean, people do this because somehow it's supposed to make you feel better that whatever happens, there's got to be some good to come out of it. And I'm sorry, some stuff there isn't good that comes out of it. You know, Hitler, the Holocaust, come on, tell me, like, why do we apply different rules to God than we do to people? It, it, you know, for people, it would be really obvious when you slaughter all kinds of people that that's not a good thing. And then somehow, God, we have different rules and just go, OK, if God does all of this, that there's got to be some wonderful purpose in it. It doesn't make sense. It's illogical. It doesn't fit what the word of God says. But it also, if you think about that relax, God's in control, it's telling you don't do anything. It's telling you not to act. It's telling you to settle for whatever crap comes your way and act like it was supposed to happen, right? And this just keeps people stuck, this kind of teaching. And I know, you know, it's funny because it's like uh, that whole thing, like I was uh, abused as a kid and sometimes people that have been through that kind of trauma, they're like, oh, but... Uh, something good came out of it because it helped me to understand or be compassionate. That doesn't mean God caused it. God wanted it to happen. If you were abused, God hated that. 
God was opposed to that. Um, it's just, it is not the will of God at all. Is it po What is possible is that sometimes in heinous situations, and we're going to see even in this situation, that when we include God in horrible situations in our life, that God is able, because remember, God chose us first, but it's up to us. Remember the last, last week, we get to choose whether we invite him into our life or not. That's free will, guys. God gave all of us free will. So uh, including the people that did bad things to you have free will, right? So, uh, but we get to choose to include God and that's when God can pull us out of really bad situations uh, is by inviting him in. So uh, another thing that happens as far as that causes this passivity uh, in terms of what people are um, saying is <laughs> sometimes people, what causes them from not doing anything is they're waiting for other people to fix it. Do you know? Sometimes, especially if the other person caused the problem, you want them to fix the problem, right? We can't control other people. doesn't matter. Like, so I'm telling you, it's not fair, you know? Like, sometimes we are mistreated by others. We can't change the hands we're dealt. There's many things that happened to us that we didn't get a choice in, but we get to choose how we respond to it. We get to choose to include God in these really hard situations in life. Um, but it's just one of those things. If we're waiting for somebody else to come fix it, whether they caused it or not, I mean, like, again, last week I was thinking about, you know, uh, when I shared with you guys as far as my marriage situation and how crazy that was, where I was looking for some other, I mean, I know it sounds so crazy. It's embarrassing, but uh, you know, we got to talk about these things. If we can't look at stuff, then we can't change things, right? Is that I was looking for somehow a person to rescue me out of that relationship, which sounds a little bit crazy. And you know why? It's because I was so afraid of letting go, which we're going to talk about that. Sometimes we got to let go of the toxic things that we're holding on to uh, that are destructive. Uh, and it's just like those lepers where they're sitting there going, hey, I'm comfortable in my city. There's a famine. People are dying. But people going, oh, I don't want to let go. It's where I'm comfortable. I know everything there, right? If I go to the Syrians, I don't know what I'm walking into. So that keeps people, right, comfortable in the toxic stuff that we're in, not wanting to take the risk of trying something that may or may not work, right? Because that happens too. A lot of times people don't want to try anything because what if it doesn't work? Do you know? If you already know that the stuff you're doing doesn't work, better to try something else, right? It's just better to shift to something else, you know, uh, than, um, than that. So anyway, uh, and number three, this teaching of time heals all hurts. No, it does not. Time by itself does not heal. You know, you have like gangrene in your finger. Oh, let's just have time heal that. If I wait long enough, it'll just get better. You know, a lot of stuff that's really broken inside of us isn't just going to magically get better on its own. If it's toxic, if it's not working, if it's not healthy, it won't just get better with time. What happens sometimes is we just get dull to the pain. We've been in it so long and we're just so used to it that it's just like we just don't feel you know, anymore. And then we're like, it's better. It's not better. We just don't feel anymore. We just calloused ourselves. We're dead inside. You know, that's not exactly healing. Um, God's got better than that. And number four, this is a huge one and definitely relates to this story is wishing there was another choice that isn't there. Do you know, like getting stuck in, in wishing, wait, I don't like these three choices. Go back to the city, stay on the road where I'm at or go to the Syrians where I might be killed still. And I went to all the effort and I still might be killed, right? <laughs> you know, that was a lot of trouble going all the way there to the Syrians. I could have just sat on the road and you know, what have you. And if I go, so many people are like, what if I go to all the trouble and it still doesn't work? Do you know what I mean? Like people do that so much when it comes to the things of God of just going, what if I try it, it doesn't work. If what's not working now isn't working, why not try something? If, if it doesn't work, where are you really any far behind, right? But the idea of just sitting there wishing there was another choice, like, uh, you know, kind of thing, wishing 
everything, you know, being in a, an abusive, you know, relationship with uh, somebody that was violent and alcoholic and just wishing that that would get better one day. Right. You know, kind of a thing or, um, uh, because I didn't like the option. It was really, uh, you know, Hey, it was really, really super screwed up in me to try and solve my problem with the adultery thing. But I was stuck there for a long time because it was so hard to think of. I was scared, man, to let go. Um, I didn't want to be alone. You know, I was like, uh, thought no other man will ever love me kind of thing and I'll be divorced. And, you know, it was really terrifying to make a change like that. I didn't know what I was in for. Um, I also was thinking about the financial part of it going, you know, we had a nice house and I was just sitting there going, Oh, I'll never have a nice house again. You know, uh, you know, a lot of stuff like that, that was just keeping me for years, even though I was in therapy my therapist was saying, you're in danger, he's going to kill you. And, um, you know, it wasn't until like a time where I didn't know if I was going to get out alive that I was just like, okay, I walked out with my shoes and wasn't sure if I, you know, and decided if I got out alive that night, I would never go back. And so, um, it was, it, it had to, it had, for me, I had to get that bad before I was ready to let go of something. Right. And a lot of times we can't see what God's got for us because we're not letting go of the toxic things that we've become dependent upon, um, to really trust that God's going to be there for us in that. And so, um, Anyway, so we act like we don't have choices because we just don't like the discomfort of making a choice that's out of our comfort zone, that's going to a place that we haven't been before. Um, anyway, uh, so let's go on to read in verse five. It says, so they looked at, I love the fact that they looked at their three choices. That's some clarity, right? The third choice kind of is, is really terrible, but <clears throat> knowing that the other two choices has zero hope of change, right? And sometimes we really have to think that through in some ways. Um, <coughs> anyway, uh, in verse 5 it says, And they rose at twilight to go to the camp of the Syrians. And when they had come to the outskirts of the Syrian camp, to their surprise, no one was there. For the Lord had caused the army of the Syrians to hear the noise of the chariots and the noise of the horses the noise of a great army. So they said to one another, look, the king of Israel has hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to attack us. Therefore they arose and fled at twilight and left the camp intact, their tents, their horses, their donkeys, and they fled for their lives. Oh my gosh, there's a few things here. Sometimes, you see, if they hadn't moved, they wouldn't have seen that God was working. Sometimes there's stuff, we gotta, there's a lot of things in the word of God where, where God's already working, but we have to make a move towards God, right? We have to, we have to take a step to see what God's doing that we don't always see. And you're not going to always see everything. You're not going to get to always see what's ahead. And a lot of times we're waiting for that. We want it all figured out and all the steps and blah, blah, blah to figure out. But moving towards God, God will always be there in these situations. So they got there. Here they're thinking to be enslaved is the best opportunity and they were all gone and left all of everything you know for them now here's what's funny too which we'll be talking about in another part of i choose the syrians left because of noise sometimes like in just looking we're going to be looking at the choices that we make man they got scared off by noise that wasn't even real you know, sometimes those are the choices that we make, right? Is that we run, we run away when there's really no danger happening at all. It's just noise. So, um, so the Syrians wound up losing out on that one there, <coughs> fleeing for their lives. And then it says in verse eight, and when these leopards, lepers came to the outskirts of the camp, they went into one tent, they ate and drank, they carried from it silver and gold and clothing and went and hid them. Then they came back and entered another tent and carried uh, some from there also and went and hid it. I'm telling you, when God is leading you someplace, right? And whenever, uh, we're going to see too, a lot of this, you moving towards God is never going to be wrong. You know, God is always going to be working and it's always beyond what you possibly 
expected, but sometimes you got to let go of some old stuff to see where God is working in this. And so, but it's always like above and beyond. These guys were happy to just be alive when they went there. That's all their expectations were like, let's hope that we just stay alive. And God gave them food and drink and gold and silver, you know, kind of a thing. And what you see later in the, in the record is right after that, after they're feasting and full and all of this from the famine is they say, should we just keep this to ourselves? They were like, no. So they went back and got the Israelites and said, come on and eat. There's food and gold and silver and everything, which again, it's part of what we're talking about with the stretch goals that when you're seeing God, even at the beginning to share what you're receiving, you know, to see what God is doing for you and to give it right away, man, right away. Um, uh, because the God can work really big time in those things. Uh, pretty cool. Uh, what's our part and what's God's part kind of a thing. Um, so I want to, in a light of this, let's look at, uh, Philippians chapter three, Ephesians, Philippians. It's all the way at the other side of the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Acts, Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, uh, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. There we go. So we go to Philippians and in chapter three and in verse 12, it says, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I, that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Okay, so there's so much in this. Um, it says, I love this, because sometimes what gets in our way of moving forward is all or nothing thinking. Perfectionism, man. Again, thinking about last week and what we were talking about, grace, man, is the cure for this. This says, the Apostle Paul says, I haven't arrived. Some of us are, you're looking for like when you're going to get it all together, that you have some idea in your mind that now you're just going to have it all, right? I've arrived. I'm on top of the mountain. Woo. You know, like I've got it all. I'm like perfect fitness and I never have to work out again. Uh, perfectly walking with God, man. I'm hearing from God. I'm praying, you know, it's done. I'm good. I've arrived. I'm at the finish line. It's a way that will keep you stuck. It'll keep you stuck from moving. We got to stop relating in this all or nothing thinking, or you won't move. You will sit by the side of the road, sit here until we die, sit we here until we die. Right. Don't like staying here. Isn't helping any, right? We don't want to stay. We want to be moving, but without this idea that we've got to get it all together. And so uh, there's so many juicy things in this. It says, I haven't attained, I haven't perfected, but here's what's in contrast. I press on. So both of these, we're going to see it stretching. This is why stretch goals, you know, God talks about basically what the whole thing is. We want to stretch. What is stretching? It's moving towards something and it's a little uncomfortable, right? A good stretch is something that's uncomfortable. If this is my stretch, is that a stretch, Mina? No. No. Okay. Right. Do you know what I'm saying? Like I stretched, right? There's like, there's stretching. We see stretching in here. That's poor, the idea, right? Doing something you're not used to that is uncomfortable, but it's not perfect, you know? And so it says uh, that I press on, and here's where we stretch towards, that I may lay hold of that for which the purpose Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. We want to grab a hold of the purpose in which Jesus grabbed a hold of us. How cool is that? I mean to tell you, Jesus, remember? Remember? God chose, and also Jesus chose, right? Jesus grabbed you. He reached for you. He's reaching for you now. He's like this. He's like, take my hand. I'm reaching for you. And here's what you do. You grab a hold. You know, you grab a hold. 
You know, we want to grab a hold of why he's grabbing a hold of us, right? For the purpose, the purpose in terms of our calling, in terms of what God's got for us is so much bigger. We think small, man. So often, a lot of this that I'm choosing is choosing not to settle for less than what God has for us. Choosing not to settle for a bub kiss, you know? It says... Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended again, to have arrived, to be at the finish line. I, don't, I, have, I haven't arrived. I'm not perfect. It's, not, it's just never going to be there. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. We do what? Forget. Forget the things which are behind, right? I'm telling you, to grab a hold of what God's got, it means a lot of times letting go of what you've been holding on to, the stuff that that's not working. I'm just going, this crap ain't working for me anymore. Do you know what I'm saying? <sighs> I, I think I'm going to try some stuff God's way. It's a process. It's progress, not perfection, as they say in 12-step. You know, 12-step, why it's so great? It's all based on the Bible, you know? It's great stuff. Uh, progress, not perfection. Uh, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching what? Forward to those things which are ahead. Reach, guess what? Reach, stretch, stretch towards what's ahead. And what's ahead? It says, I press, still reaching, see? Reach, you see there's like three times we're seeing that reaching, stretching thing, right? <clears throat> stretching but not perfection. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. <sighs> There's nothing bigger than God's call for you. Whatever you have in, in mind for you, God's got bigger. Whenever you seek God, whenever you stretch towards doing the things of God, Things in your life will change because it's supernatural, because God is big and creator of all of life. It's not doing life alone. It's not being self-reliant. It's interrupting those habits of self-reliance that are destructive, that keep us stuck, you know, trying to be our own, you know, solution to everything, but reaching towards God's upward call for us. It's just, there's a prize. There's a reward. Jeez, it's just multi multifaceted in so many things that what God's got is just bigger, right? In so many ways, in every part. Whenever I've seen people seek God first, you know, a lot of times everybody's trying to make their lives better, you know, in, in like, okay, I'm going to put all my money, all my money, all my energy into making money and having a career. Do you know what I mean? Like so many things that people like try and get everything together and then they'll go, okay, then I'll reach for God. It's just the opposite, man. It's just the opposite. It's supernatural. It's just like whenever I've seen people that go, I'm going to seek God first because that's what God's word says. If we put him first, other things in our life start just getting better. Marriages get better. Career stuff gets better. If you try and do it the other way, it doesn't, it doesn't work and it's exhausting. You know, let's go to, um, uh, let me see. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 9. Go back a couple books. Past Ephesians, Galatians, Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. Oops, here we go. Second Corinthians 12 in verse 9. This is speaking about Jesus, and the, it's the Apostle Paul talking about Jesus speaking to him. In verse 9, it says, And he, Jesus, said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. Remember, we talked about that last week. For my strength is made perfect in what? Weakness. Weakness. Oh, you mean not our strength? Do you know what I'm saying? It's just like so many times we think it's up to us to get all strong, put together, to come to God, right? It says, Jesus says, my grace is enough. My strength, Jesus' strength is made perfect in our weakness. This is like when we want to go to him in our weakness that we become strong and not self-reliant. 
Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities, in the places I screw up, in the places I'm weak, in the places that I'm short. You know what? I love to boast in my infirmities. Do you know most people are boasting about what they've got that's so great and so successful? You know what I mean? You know, accomplishments, whatever. It's just like, honestly, that's why you see grace more when you talk about your crap. I almost said the other thing. Um, you know, you see grace more when you talk about it, right? And um, it's just like that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Like the more that we see where we're weak, we let the power of Christ in. You know, we make room for our need for him. Therefore, I take pleasure in my infirmities, reproaches, and needs, and persecutions, and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong, you know? Um, it's honestly, it's getting connected and in reality about our weaknesses that allows us to invite and to go, nope, I want to be strong in Christ because I am limited, you know, um, uh, and not want to do things on my own. Again, this is the whole thing that we're talking about as far as why it's so big about why in the fellowships, the stretch goals, you see radical life change. It's just like that verse we're stretching, you know towards the high calling kind of a thing. Not perfect, but we're moving in that direction. We're getting a little bit uncomfortable, right, to do some things, to see uh, God work, to see Jesus work in powerful, powerful ways. Um, anyway, so also in the, in the um, uh, fellowships where we're not doing it on our own, where we've got people in our fellowships, there's another verse that says to, to look at the ant, and how the ant works, you know, to learn from an ant, you know, and you ever think, um, what can I learn from an ant? Right. <laughs> you know, uh, God says, take a look at the ant and learn. So, um, you know, what's interesting is that the ant doesn't see the whole thing for one, they just grab something and start moving. Right. And then the other thing is they don't try and do it by themselves. You ever, ants wouldn't go anywhere if it was just like a solo ant by, by themselves kind of a thing. But together, and taking some small steps kind of a thing. Ants, it's so, ants are so small and they accomplish so much, right? It's unbelievable to see what happens. And so there's the power in fellowship and being there to help one another to stretch and to move towards God. So, and I choose, you cannot control the hand you're dealt, right? Sometimes we're dealt some really crappy hands, but we get to choose to invite God into it. We get to choose how we respond, you know, and God gives us the free will. God gives us the, cho the choice to choose him. God gives us the choice to stretch towards him so that we get to see the power. You know, God, God gives us the choice, right? That's wonderful. And then in Jesus, when we connect with our weaknesses, we can choose him instead of choosing to be self-reliant instead of choosing our own strength to rely on his strength, right? So powerful stuff on I choose. We've got lots of other things. Uh, but I want you to just like think about in the stretch goals in particular, you know, some of the things we really want you to just try to stretch on all five of these things. It's not, it's not perfection. It's just stretching, getting a little uncomfortable, right? just to see what the possibilities are and to just let go of the stuff that's not working. So in this meditation, we're going to do a little bit of a meditation and maybe God can reveal some things to you. Uh, if you open your heart, when you're doing meditation, uh, kind of a thing and you're seeking God's voice, especially if you're open to hearing whatever he says, like even if it's different than how you wanted it to be, um, the more we stay open to that, you know, the more that we'll hear from God. So I want to just do a little meditation. If you guys get on your knees, if you can, if there's room, uh, at your fellowship, uh, it, it's just so much more powerful to get on your knees. If you're able to do that, um, if you can't, uh, you know, just sit in a chair and relax for everybody just to settle in and to close your eyes. And the first thing is it always starts like, man, it just shifts things so big to focus on how big God is.
what are the things that help you? Like right now, so, so much during our day, we don't even notice that we're in the presence of God. But just to stop and take in that right now, God, this invisible being who made everything. And maybe you're not sure if God's real, that's okay. It's great that you're here. This is just a time to be curious if God is real. To think about if God is real, think about how big God has to be to have made all the things that he made. What are some of the things that help you to see that? What are some of your favorite things in nature? Boggles my mind sometimes I think about the same God who made an ant, made a frog, made the grass, made a banana. So many colors, so many scents, so many forms of life. And that God says he loves you. Just to take his love in right now. I want you to think about an area of life that is not moving, that you feel stuck. It feels like the same pain has been there and it just goes on and on and on and on. Maybe it has to do with something that you had nothing, you had no choice in. It was somebody else's choices. And think about the right now choosing to move towards God in that part of your life. What would that look like? Ask God to show you. what it would look like to include him. What would be a choice to move towards God? And then think about even stretching. Where are areas you need to stretch towards God? Places that might be uncomfortable? But where God's got more for you. Maybe you're not sure if God's got more, but it's worth trying.
You take some time to be in the presence of Jesus. Jesus said his grace is sufficient for you, that his strength is made perfect in your weakness. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your goodness and your love. That you hate that there's so many times that we're put in situations that are hurtful that aren't your will at all. Areas that we have, uh, have been hurt in, whether it's health things or whether it's being hurt by other people that just aren't fair, that aren't your will, aren't your desire but that you want to be there for us in it, that nothing is impossible for you, that you're able to heal. And to help us to just include you more and to stop trying to do it all by ourselves. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Love you guys so much. Think this week about stretch goals. What are some of the stretch goals you haven't really stepped out in yet? Maybe, you know, uh, you tried some juicy prayer, right? You're, obviously, you're doing fellowship, right? Uh, kind of a thing and spending time in the Word of God, uh, spending time helping others, sharing what you're learning. That's a stretch one. You want to start on that one right away, you know, start giving what you're receiving kind of a thing. Anyway, love you guys. See you for week three of I Choose. All right, guys, and here comes a section where I'm really passionate about this because it's made so many changes in my life, and it's the area of giving. Most of you guys may not know this, but I actually had been let go from a sales job before, and I'll tell you this, guys, it was one of the most stressful times of my life, but I'll tell you what, here's one thing that's really incredible. I was let go on a Monday, guess what? Got hooked up with a job on, on that same Wednesday. So God is big, guys. This job has been such a huge blessing for me, but I would not have been able to spot it if I was already giving and seeing God work in a big way. So here's your opportunity to see God big and to believe God big. So guys, there's a couple of ways for you guys to give. You can give through the mobile app, you can give through one of these searchlight envelopes right in the luxury of your own fellowship. Believe God big today.